Good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening here and welcome at uh, DEX Education, an exchange on the craft and culture of DJing, uh, proudly presented by Kiosk Radio and uh, VGC. Welcome bij DEX Education, een uitwisseling over de kunde en cultuur van het DJ door uh, Kiosk en VGC. We're teaming up with Kiosk affiliates uh, BBSEC, Lola Haro, uh, Left to Early Bird and YouTube to mentor aspiring DJs through the exchange of insights on DJing in a series of talks and uh, workshops. En daarom werken we samen met uh, BBSEC, Lola Haro, uh, Left to Early Bird en YouTube aan een reeks van talks en uh, workshops om uh, DJ's te inspireren. Today marks the very start of DEX Education with a panel talk uh, by the four mentors of the program here next to me. En vandaag is de start van DEX Education met een panel talk met de vier uh, mentoren van dit uh, programma. Um, I have the mentors here right next to me, all four, and uh, I want to start um, quite informally uh, with the first quick round of questions uh, to get to know our panelists a bit better. Probably you all know them already, but some questions to get us started. Uh, first, your name and stage name, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Bibi Sick. Um, everyone calls me Bibi as well. Um, yeah, that's my name and my stage name. <laughs> My name is Lola Haro, and I also play under my own name. So. No, no. <laughs> my name is Lefto Early Bird, or uh, simply Lefto. It's not my real name. My real name is Stéphane, Stéphane Lallemand. Wow. <laughs> uh, my, my real name is Ingmar, and my made-up name is uh, Youth Youth. So this recently, because it used to be Youth, but... Did someone ever had a, like another stage name, maybe at the very beginning of their careers? Was it? I used to be called Ya Allo. Ya Allo? <laughs> Long time ago. Because I used to say it a lot. Ya Allo. And you didn't used to share your, your real name, right? For a long time? For a really long yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. It happens. Stefan. Why would you, why should you know? You know? <laughs> Lefto. Uh, I used to DJ in a, a drum and bass duo before, like a long time ago. And it was called Drop Shots. Drop shot. I like that. <laughs> What's your uh, current place of living, baby? Um, I live in Antwerp. I am from Antwerp, but I recently moved to Brussels. Okay. Mm. I pretty much live here, right there. <laughs> and I also live in Scarbeek, <laughs> just a five minute um, bike ride from here. So this is home. Uh, yeah, I, I call this home as well. I live in, <coughs> been living in Brussels for 10 years. Also, just right around the corner. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, your preferred DJ setup? Um, I like uh, three CDJs uh, and then one Pioneer mixer. Doesn't really, uh, I don't really prefer any any type or edition. I just like Pioneer. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's like I prefer to have two turntables and also two CDJs. And from Mixer, I prefer Xone 92. It just simply works the best for me. I have it at home as well, so yeah, it's most uh, comfortable for me. Okay. I like the Kiosk Radio setup. Uh, two CDJ 3000s, Pioneer and a Pioneer uh, A9 mixer. And if I play vinyl, I'd rather choose an ENS uh, 400 rotary mixer. Okay, nice. Uh, I prefer having three CDJs as well, um, and yeah, I do really like the 3000 uh, model because I use the hot cues a lot. And on the 3000, you have like all eight hot cues. Ten. You have ten? Yeah. On the 3000? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> well, I only use eight, but uh, good to know I can use ten <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, so for the next uh, 90 minutes, approximately, we'll discuss a few topics that are relevant for DJs, any kind of DJs, really, regardless of the kind of music or the size of the audience you uh, have in front of you. This panel aims to inspire and inform, and we are always available to answer your questions. Uh, so just to raise your hand anytime or wait until the end of the talk as uh, we'll finish with a round of questions from the audience. Um, the debate is um, di divided into a few parts, and the first part is about, it has a simple question, what's a DJ? Um, the question may sound superficial, yet isn't always as straightforward as it may sound. 
I believe that every DJ at some point in their formative years, while practicing and reaching out to the world with their newly chosen DJ alter ego, lived a moment of vulnerability and doubt, asking themselves the question, am I really entitled to be called a DJ? Does anyone here remember that this moment in their lives? This moment of doubt when you were not sure yet whether or not you were a DJ? Lefto, you were always a DJ? You were born a DJ? I think so. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> always. Always been. I Since the school days, I used to um, I used to be the, the, the local, I mean, the DJ at the school, at the end of the year school parties, like the, the proms. Yeah. That's, yeah, I've been doing it for The music time. selector, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Selections. Yeah. yeah. Someone else here with more vulnerability? Um, yeah, with me, it took me a long time to really say, like, I am a DJ now, because uh, I also, I started out playing more hip-hop, more underground stuff, and then hip-hop became super popular. So then you had to kind of play what was on the radio, otherwise people wouldn't really dance. And then I didn't feel like I was actually, um, like, bringing something to the people. I think I was just um, doing what was expected of me in some way and then I, I kind of soul searched a bit more to different genres and then I um, discovered like house music and disco and I think the first time I really thought now I'm a DJ was only like four or five years ago maybe um, the first time I played Horst uh, it was really nice and there was a lot of people dancing and then I thought ah, I can really make them dance maybe I am a DJ so it took me a while to get there yeah yeah, you, Lola? I think for me it's actually only recently since like half a year that I, I mean, uh, of course as well, but since half a year that I'm confident of what I'm doing because for a long time I was always doubting if I was deserving it already to to have a lot of visibility or a lot of gigs because I was still... Yeah, you're still searching your style and like fine tuning your your craft, I think. And it takes just a really long time, I think, before you I always knew what I wanted to play, but it took some time to know how I would bring it. And I of course with practicing and having a lot of experiences and gigs you you learn you get used to it as as well. So I guess it's only since few months that I think like okay. I can call myself that one, but I, I don't. I don't really think that a DJ should uh, should be seen as someone who can make people dance as well. I think you could be just a DJ and just be a good mixer, but mixing ambient or yeah, soul like down tempo stuff. So as long as you're just jockeying the discs, so many know. definitions to the word DJ, right? Yeah, yeah. Igmar, how, how is that for you? Um, it's been a long time as well for me to, you know, to, to remember I've been DJing half my life, I realized yesterday. <laughs> so, but I'd, I think every DJ goes through that stage where people don't take you seriously. Like the first few gigs that you have is like, oh, person X that I know is apparently selecting tunes at this party, but they don't, you know, necessarily see you as a DJ. But yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's just a uh, part of the process where where in every creative endeavor that you take in the beginning is just you you're doing with you're doing it with what you know and you don't can you can't take it seriously maybe in the beginning anyway yeah where did you learn the craft can, can you define that um actually it started with virtual dj <laughs> um so just you know testing out what all the buttons did and and learning the terminology of what every button does and then i had uh, i was lucky cuz i was you know starting to learn to dj together with a friend the drop shot partner yeah <laughs> and um yeah we just learned it by 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 testing stuff out like a trial and error on on um, on decks that we bought together so yeah I didn't, yeah, tutorials weren't even a thing then. We didn't have a mentor, so it was just, yeah, trial and error, really. Yeah. Did you have mentors, Lola? Uh, yes, I had, like, like the first person that learned me how to DJ was uh, Pires, a DJ from Antwerp, because he was a good friend of my parents, and my parents were also pretty involved in the party scene in Antwerp. And, yeah, I wanted to learn how to play records, and he explained me at a very young age already, but then actually I kind of, 
I didn't drop it, but I didn't have the equipment at home uh, to continue it. And then later, I think when I was 19, um, my boyfriend at the time then, he learned me how to DJ, but through a controller and record box on the computer. And uh, yeah, once that I managed this, I picked up playing records, like learning how to play records again. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's how okay. it went. Um, we all know that DJ world was a male-dominated world for a long time. Um, is it harder for a woman to, be, to become a DJ? Bibi, do you think? Um, I think nowadays it's it's better, it's improved a lot. There's a lot of female DJs uh, out there, um, which I really love to see. But I feel like in the beginning, uh, for me, which was like 11 years ago already, I think I was 16, um, I felt a lot of um, people were looking down on me and like, oh, she's just booked because she's a girl and she's pretty and she doesn't, she doesn't really know how to DJ. And maybe in the beginning it was true because I wasn't so good technically yet, but um, it really motivated me to um, really like um, get confident in my my craft and really the technical side as well, like understand everything and um, which I'm I'm grateful for because I think that's one of the reasons where um, that I am where I am today because yeah. because of the prejudice and because of. Um, the, the lack of belief of other people it pushed you harder. Yeah, it pushed me harder. But I think nowadays it's it's very open and there's um, it's not like a special thing anymore being a, a girl that teaches. Yeah. and I really like that. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. Did you also experience that, Lola? Yeah, of course. Like I think nowadays, indeed, as Bibi said, I think women or like all different kind of people have more chances now to become a DJ or any other um, job actually there's more like equal chances but as a woman I think indeed they say more often these kind of uh, things and that we need to work harder to show that it's not true but I had the same like it motivated me to to show that that to work harder and to yeah make it worth it to that the place that I have that I deserve it yeah yeah but yeah yeah um, when we look at history we see very roughly said two types of DJ emerge, emerge in the 60s and the 70s there was the entertainer on the one hand who was really talking in between records creating a real show and on the other hand there was the anonymous DJ the music freak the, the always digging for previously unheard uh, music uh, Lefter what do you think what, what comes first That's a good question. <laughs> um, what did you learn first, you personally? To entertain, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, the school thing um, was pretty much trying to entertain all my friends. So I guess entertaining. I was very shy to grab the mic back in the days, but um, I found a good way of doing it in the end. So it is, um, um, I think, grabbing the mic is a, is a good way to uh, connect with your crowd. Um, sometimes it's a very good thing because when they're super far away, you know, there is no connection. It's really tough. So if you talk to them and they respond in their own way, you know, you, you feel the connection which you wouldn't maybe have if you don't do it because everything's far. Yeah. So there is this connection that I really like these days to just talk to them because in the end they're there for they're there for you. So you know it's a good thing. So did you learn that in the hip hop scene? No, nope. I um, I learned that um, from some of my mentors like Giles Peterson, who's a big radio host, radio guy from the BBC in um, in the UK. And I, I just realized that when I was listening to him and him talking to us, I felt a connection. So um, I think it's, um, it's a healthy way to be in uh, touch with your crowd. It's good. Yeah. It's good. And it's, um, I think it's important even, in, especially these days, to, to be more in touch with your crowd. And, and it gives you a warm kind of feeling towards them. Yeah. Yeah, Igmar, do you ever talk the mic during your shows? 
Uh, yeah, I learned how to get past that anxiety <laughs> like two years ago, some, something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I do it sometimes. But I cringe afterwards when I hear myself talk. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to think about it, actually. <laughs> Usually it's something like, are you still alive? Are you still feeling it? <laughs> yeah, just my brain at that moment, uh, freestyling, I guess. But yeah, it's still, I guess, it's still good to talk to them and address them so people feel included. I think it's a, it, actually, I was thinking about it, but I, I, I think it's a lot of... Um, radio DJs doing it actually yeah that you used to just host the show and so you talk and when you play a tune sometimes you like to share what you're playing so oh, guys this is the new from XYZ boom so it's it's nice and people are like oh nice you know yeah it's, it's like a storytelling that you do yeah Bibi would you ever do that no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I'm pretty shy, and I, uh, I I just don't know what I would would bring to the music because I have a lot of um, like high energy tracks and a lot of uh, vocals as well, and I I'd like to let the music speak yeah. for itself. Yeah. yeah, I'm too shy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even this is quite difficult for me. So. <laughs> You're doing very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lola, what comes first for you? Do do, do you find there's a there's a, a need to entertain while DJing? It really depends. Like I have gigs that I'm really like in it and dancing and like laughing a lot, and other gigs that I'm really focused and that I don't dance at all or don't make eye contact. But it's not because I don't want to entertain, but it's because I'm I'm seriously like working on focused. how I want to build the vibe or the especially when you play set with records and like the conditions are all, not always like 100% on point, then you need to focus. So then I don't focus on dancing and laughing. And I mean, obviously on gigs, it also, it adds also something to the vibe if you do so. But I don't think, I mean, I don't think it aligns with music that I want to play. I don't no. think that it's necessary. Uh, I also cannot imagine that I would ask during my set, like if people like the music that I'm playing or are you feeling it? Like it's just not the, the vibe of the music that I play. So, but of course it's always nice to see a DJ enjoy their sets as well and interact with the crowd. But I can, as a, when I party myself, I can also just enjoy watching a DJ or listening a DJ who is very focused and seriously in it because you can see that they, they take it serious. And do you have an advice to connect with your audience? Maybe a secret tip. <laughs> or sometimes it's... Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Like, I cannot force it. So it yeah. happens when it happens. Yeah. And of course, sometimes I can be like, oh, maybe I'm... Maybe I I don't look happy, and but I am happy. Yeah. So maybe I should try to <laughs> smile a little bit. Yeah. But uh, like most of the time, I just... I think music and, and playing it's you also play with feelings so I think it's important to also just show your honest feeling and 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 not force something because it will come off over wrong I mean that's how it's for me yeah. at least yeah 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 do you have a special trick left to, to connect with an audience when it's not working I don't know, I was just thinking that um, when I don't feel comfortable, I usually don't talk to the people. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how they know, or maybe they don't, but if I don't talk usually, or I don't connect with them at all, it means that I'm not feeling good behind the turntables for some reason. It might be technical or just the vibe. Yeah. Um, but there's no real um, tip, I think. It's just, you need to do it the way, if it needs to feel right for you. And it's true that um, what Lola says, I think there, there are also genres of music where it's not necessary to talk in between or just talk over. Yeah, I think like a lot of techno doesn't need to be, you know, you don't need to talk about over techno music. No. You just let it be. And the, the people are into their zones anyway. So they, you'll figure it out at the end if they liked it. Yeah. When you're done in last song, thank you, bye. You'll yeah. see if they react or not. True. I have a question for all of you, actually. Who is your favorite DJ and why? Who wants to start? 
Uh, my favorite DJ is Shaka Lion. It's a guy from Brazil, um, affiliated with Selection. And the reason why I look up to him is he's very playful with um, how he makes transitions. It's not like uh, there's one trick and I'm going to loop it or do the outro to the intro or some shit like that. He really plays around with it. He chops off little samples. He uses hot cues a lot. He goes from the original to a track that sampled it. He switches between BPMs effortlessly. And I think that's for me the the ultimate like goal of DJing is really uh, using the tracks in a, in a new context and not just transitioning from track A to track B. The 10 Q points. <laughs> the Q points, man. I love him. <laughs> um, Bibi, who's your favorite DJ? Uh, it's a difficult question because um, I have a lot of favorites, but one of my ultimate favorites is uh, Honey Dijon. I think she's technically really good she's um you just she i mean she lived through a lot of the history of house music as well coming from new york and um i feel like her sets are also educational while being like very danceable as well and i think it's really something that i want to do as well and um i listened to like a, an hour-long podcast she did once um and it was very informative and you can just tell like she really, really loves music. She knows it by heart. She knows her stuff. She knows what she's doing. And she has the same birthday as me. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's really someone I look, yeah, I look up to her. I think she's really cool. And, yeah. Uh, she's older. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, Lola? Uh, yeah, to be honest, I don't really have like one favorite DJ. I mean, I find it very hard to say, like, I can get inspired by so many different DJs in different genres and also mostly also through friends who are like, this is motivating me actually the most, like people from my own generation who are uh, motivated or like digging or like, um, how do you say, like, uh, yeah, bringing each other like more up and... I find it hard to just name like one DJ that I say like this is every time yeah. it's and yeah I think I get my inspiration a bit from everywhere yeah, yeah. was Marcel Detman among the DJs that you I mean, admired like yeah like when I just started of course it was uh, like it's it's a legend actually but nowadays what we play is like completely different but it was super cool to to play with him because yeah, he really, he can, because he's mostly known for his techno, but he can play really everything. He has, he can play house, he can play even minimal dubby techno, yeah. so he has such a big repertoire. So, it, yeah, it was amazing for sure. Cool. Lefto? I'm a bit like Lola. Uh, I, I don't have a favorite DJ. I think that everyone can inspire someone. I'm, I'm a lot at the kiosk in the week, in the weekends when I can, and I get inspired by one song that one DJ plays and another song from the next DJ. So in a way I, I absorb all these things and I end up maybe playing also those tunes or mixing them with someone that I thought was like, oh, this is, this is actually quite cool together. Um, yeah, I guess my favorite DJs are, are also my best friends. And they might be Louis Vega or someone else or J-Rock or Giles. Um, yeah, I don't know. They, they're very close, at, at least. I mean, okay. I don't know. Is it's DJing hard. an art form, you think? Definitely. It is an art form, but uh, the most importantly, I think that DJing is also channeling. I, I call it channeling because it's like the, the producer who makes a track gives it to you and you give it to the crowd. I think that's the most important job and task for a DJ is is to help the producer who made an ex extremely nice track to make sure that your crowd knows about that track. I think that's the most important. I, I, there's a lot of DJs who, for example, never share their playlist. And I think that's the least you could do because otherwise those guys might just stay in their bedrooms yeah. and be unknown forever. So I think foremost, the, the most important job is to help those guys who make all that music in their bedrooms or in the studios or wherever and make sure that it comes out and that everybody in front of you hears it and likes it or not. And if he likes it, goes on the internet and buys it or supports it. 
Yeah, it's very important. That's the only thing that's that's important to me as a DJ is to make sure that all that new music gets out there, promoting the scene. Exactly. Yeah. What happens here at Kiosk as well? It's, yes, yeah. and it's been happening. It's been like that for almost 30 years. Yeah, true. Anyone else something to say about this the art form? Uh, I always compare it with making a collage, like a collage artist, because mm -hmm. you use existing elements, like the tracks of the producers. And for me, the artist is putting it in a new context, creating a new arrangement of track, that track there, that track there, the way you mix it. That's, yeah, that's for me the art behind it. Yeah. And it's, it's um, digital um, culture technology. Is that very important for you in, in that matter to play with all with the tracks really in a fast way during your set? Uh, I'm not sure if I can the, the question. The, the, it's the, the, the digital technology that happens nowadays compared to when it was just two records and a turntable. Oh, yeah. Is that very important for you? Um, yes, it does help with creativity when it comes to mixing tracks but I think even before that the, the metaphor of uh, collage making still applies to yeah. when you just transition from track A to, to track B because you still yeah you still select uh, tracks in different contexts contexts that's a hard word to pronounce um, but and you still put them in a new context so yeah no it still applies even without all the technical um, uh, shit yeah. that's out there It works also with three or four turntables. It's also a kind of a collage you could make. Yeah. Like someone like, I don't even know, DJ Rum, Drum, Drum. I don't know how you even <laughs> pronounce it. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's one of those guys with turntables that makes a beautiful collage as well. So it works in, a, in yeah. an old school way as well. Yeah. Nicely. Yeah. <laughs> do you um, maybe look at the digital technology as some kind of endless way of options? Or do you feel you master it and it's... You, you have it now? Um, I think it's an endless amount of options, of course, because um, you can decide where you want to put the loop, you can pick different hot cues, you can you can uh, take a vocal track and just use the a cappella and then use it on a different... There is like endless options, um, which can sometimes also be, be overwhelming, but it also gives you a lot of room to play around and... Um, I mean, I have a lot of vinyl at home as well, but I decide not to play it. Yeah. Um, also because I'm just scared to fuck up live. I don't want to... I'm very perfectionist and I want it to be to be good when I play in front of people. Um, not meaning that like making a mistake makes it bad, but it's just my personal preference. Um, so I think, um, yeah, using uh, like USB or playing with USBs, uh, yeah, I think it's important because... Yeah, there's just a lot of options and I think... Are you still learning to use the machines or do you feel like you mastered the whole thing now? I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I think you, you can never stop learning and, and I have a lot of DJ friends as well and sometimes I hear them play in a certain way or, or use a certain trick or do like a backspin or, or use the, the rewind um, during a, a, a transition. I'm like, oh, wow, you can do that. And then next time I try it out and then it works out and then I use it in my, in my sets as well. Um, so I keep I keep learning, yeah. Every every year, every every time I, I play, um, sometimes I'm even like, oh wow, I can do this, or I can <laughs> use this loop, or I can do that, and so yeah, there's a lot of um, yeah. I, ways to is it also? I mean, the technology is beautiful, but also sometimes makes you disconnect from the crowd as well. If you're too busy with stuff at the same time, like you know, performing almost more than DJing. You know, it's almost like life, you, like using the cue points and you know, all that stuff that you do sometimes can create that sense that you're actually so much in your bubble that you forget about everything else, that you don't even look up anymore. It's like you're just doing your thing. Yeah. And with that new technology that, for example, Serato has these days where you can actually um, mute every single uh track you can mute the drums from a song or you can mute the voice you can mute the, the bass line it's it's a whole new level of DJing yeah. it's not 100% perfect it's still like kind of AI-ish and it's like the sound is not I think on a big sound system it doesn't sound too good but I've seen sets at Kiosk where they, you do it 
beautifully where you're like, oh, I just want the acapella now and I mix just the drums from that other track. It's beautiful, but at the same time, you're so into it that the, the DJing as being, as, as in just connecting with your crowd kind of disappears. Yeah. Because you know, you're too much into it. It's a risk. Yeah. It's not a risk. Mm. It's your thing. But it's not. Uh, the, there's less magic, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Between your, the crowd and yourself. Yeah. Or, or you get get used to it so well that it doesn't take too much away from looking up. And but that takes time, of course, because you yeah you need to and get becomes, comfortable with it. Yeah, it becomes a routine almost. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, Lola, you, you told us that sometimes you play with vinyl, sometimes so mostly digitally. Um, when do you decide, how do you decide whether or not it's going to be a vinyl night or a digital night? Like recently, actually, I play more vinyl than digital, okay. but it depends. Like, for example, now at Paradise City, when I did the back to back with, with Marcel Detman, just to be 100% sure, he also likes to play on four, four decks uh, CDJ. And I was just like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play just like 100% sure on digital. But Mostly I play vinyl, or I take it with me at least. And of course, when the turntables are, or the setup is really not good, I have all my digital music, all, um, my records also digitalized. Some DJs don't do that, but if you come at a lot of places, and there's also a lot of, like most of the DJs play digital, so even the people who do the setup are not always even knowing how to set up record players properly, and I just, like most importantly, is to play good, good music and to be able to perform as good as possible, so I have everything backed up, um, just to be sure. Yeah. But I will always try first uh, records. Yeah, yeah. I wonder from all of you, how do you prepare for a DJ set? What's your like routine in preparing a, a, a big set, let's say on a Sunday or a Saturday, whatever? How do you spend the week? Um, I start by looking up new music. Um, sometimes I don't because... Um, I also have so much music on my stick that I haven't really discovered yet. So sometimes I just go to my to my deck and then I, I, I take my little book with all my... I keep like a notebook with all my sets in there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, mostly I, I download new music and then I, I, I play them and then I see if they work on like a better sound system. Um, and then I just start creating. I, I always mix in key, so I just... Um, look at other tracks that I just download if they match the vibe or not and then yeah it's just trial and error sometimes you play live the set that you prepared at home and it doesn't work sometimes you improvise live and it does work and then you you use sets from the part that you uh, the set uh, parts from the set that you played earlier in different sets as well because you know it works um, so yeah it's just a process of of cutting and, and putting it together and and what's with the notebook that you just mentioned it's I'm pretty OCD so <laughs> um, it's in case that I forget um, a transition um, I just have a little notebook where I, I write everything down and I, I write um, transitions down and okay. songs that work together and um, yeah, I always have it with me in case that I in case that my brain my brain just blanks and I, I don't know what to to play next and I check my notebook but I never do it's just there um, just it's just like of, a safeguard yeah. yeah it's something that, yeah. that and it's also nice to look back um, on like different sets um, like in the book I have sets that I played years ago uh, that I still can look at like oh yeah this worked really well and it's really nice um, actually yeah. it's a yeah. nice archive <laughs> yeah Lola how do you prepare I used to do that as well, like look every weekend, every week like digital for a lot of new music when I was still playing only digital. But I have the feeling now since I play records, I, I like digitally there's like so much music to find and I had the feeling that sometimes just to, that I wanted to play new music so badly every weekend that I was sometimes downloading or buying digital music that maybe I was not 100% sure of, but at least I had something new to show. And now I changed that. I just put more time and dedication and effort in selecting the, the right ones that fit well together. 
And I think now, for example, if I prepare, I don't only, like, especially now it's festival season, when you have like a lot, yeah, it's open air or the same kind of slots. For me, it's important to have like a good base, like a good bag and a good backup stick uh, with like a wide like selection that fits really well together, but that I don't change it every weekend because I have the feeling the longer I play with the same music, the better I bring it and the more different options that I find with it. And I, before when I was changing my bag every week, I, I was sometimes so insecure while playing because I actually didn't know how to do it. And if you try transition at home and then you want to do it as exactly the same in the club, for me it stresses me because if it doesn't work out then, yeah. or I don't feel actually the track that I prepared at home at the moment in the club, then I get stressed and then I get blocked. So I try to put just a lot of effort in the selection, be confident of the selection that I have with me, and then just believe my intuition intuition, and uh, yeah, just see how I feel in the moment, and, and then mostly it works out. <laughs> okay, cool. Lefto, um, what's your weekly routine or... I, no routine. I, there is a routine, but I don't, I don't really um, uh, uh, prepare. But my, my routine is um, doing my weekly Sunday show on Kiosk. And um, all the tracks that I play, I'm just looking at the people and I see how they react. And then I'm like, mm, this, this, this tune and that tune might work in the club, whatever. But then I go home, all the tracks that I played, I start to put them in folders by genre, like uh, house, techno, hip hop, jazz jazz dance, uh, so whatever, and then I just copy it f to four different sticks, and that's it. You must have a huge library. Um, yes. <laughs> Terabytes? Two tera. Two tera. So, and, and you copy on four identical sticks? Yes. To be sure. To and, a, and a master, uh, H, the master hard drive, yeah. which is the two tera on the little sticks which is 256 and 128 gigs extreme pros very good sand disc the best ones i guess the fastest ones also for record box um those ones are just essential playlists on there like essential genres yeah there's not like it's not like going deep into it yeah but i always have uh, my hard drive with me my two tera because you never know i think lola was happy to have hers uh, with marcel Deppman yeah uh, this yeah. weekend <laughs> Maybe quickly give the story to the people. <laughs> or can we do that? <laughs> yeah, now it's too late anyway. So yeah, no, I we had to play back to back, and um, he forgot his USB at the hotel. So the first hour, or, or like the first first forty minutes, we had to play with my USB, which I was really not happy about. But I was luckily I had a backup with me from like all the music that I ever selected in like eight years of selecting music and he was not playing random music it, or that he didn't know it was not that he was just guessing he was looking the first half an hour then for music that he recognized on my stick and then when his stick uh, arrived we continued uh, with his music but yeah you can imagine <laughs> it was quite of a, a bummer at the beginning but yeah. and good all good it worked out it's, yeah. it's really difficult to play with someone else's stick because but he knew the music so the yeah. few not everything if but you search by name it's fine he, he searched by name yeah the c categories for everyone are different and you name yeah. them different as well you know you just name them by the by the way that you think this is how i i hear it like a can be like boom boom chick yeah. or it could be something else you know but like just the way you like it I'm actually writing a book about Fuse uh, the, the, the nightclub at the moment and in history of Fuse it, it happened that people DJs arrived without records because the record company fucked up and then they took the record to the DJ to the local record store to find new records for the gig 
<laughs> it happened with Jeff Mills once. This last minute. Yeah, really, like on a Saturday afternoon, <laughs> go and find new records. Yeah, but but there are concepts like that. Um, I played a concept in Miami, in Miami at Dante's Hi-Fi, where it's a, a DJ called Rich Medina. It's his entire collection in the back. And so you play a five-hour set with his records on the wall. So you just go yeah. and you just take everything you find. There's a few concepts like that in the yeah. US, more in the US than here than here in Europe, I think. But uh, I kind of like the concept. Yeah. And it's like by genre as well. Like, oh, you want the house? Oh, it's over there. Oh, you want the, you want the, the, the whatever? It's over there. So. Well, you used to, you, you've been DJing for quite a long time. When you were playing with records, how many records did you take on a gig? Because you play s such a wide variety of music. Six crates. Six crates. Six, seven crates. And I always needed a car. And you don't have a driver's license. Have, <laughs> <laughs> so I always had to hustle uh, someone <laughs> to come with me. But yeah, it was about six to seven crates, and the crates were like this. So yeah, it was hardcore. quite crazy times yeah. to take all these crates. Because yeah, and especially for all-nighters, when you, you want to play the whole range, yeah. you had to take all these crates with you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice times. Yeah different times. Um, Igmar, uh, what's it like for you to prepare DJ sets? Uh, the first step is thinking about uh, the, the context of the show, so where I'm playing, the kind of promoter, the kind of concept, um, the kind of crowd, the venue, all of that, the time slot, of course. And then it's quite similar than the others, I think. Um, yeah, downloading new music, checking with the music that you already have, create, yeah, sort it in playlist. Usually I make like one playlist for that specific show. Um, sometimes I do improvise. And I also have uh, like a backup playlist, which is, uh, yeah, per genre as well. Yeah. So it's quite similar as the others, I think. Actually, I had a question for you, because um, I was wondering if it can get uh, overwhelming having such. Yeah, such a vast selection with you every time uh, when you're improvising, like... Um, no, because I think the way it is organized, it is quite um, clear. Yeah. It's quite easy to just go into the folders and you put them maybe in, even into um, added latest, you know, and then you go... Yeah. And then you find the ones that you you look for the the freshest stuff that you've put in your folder. So you go all the way down, or you just uh, I don't remember if you can put add the lat latest added in the in in yeah yeah, you yeah? Can. well yeah. But then no, it's quite clear. And do you, do you use other uh, ways of sorting outside of putting them in folders? Because you have other tools on record box. You know you can you can get, you can give them stars on five. You can add tags. You can give them <laughs> colors. No, I don't. Don't just do just all that <laughs> shit. No. I don't have time for stars or for or for keys as well. No, I I, I don't do that. Okay. I I like to do I, I like to improvise a lot. I think it's very creative to improvise. It's scary sometimes, and you never know how the crowd's going to react. Like if you play techno and then you decide to just play some crazy 160 jazz in, into it, and then like ooh, and then. Anyway, you do it, and then you get back into the techno, and they, I mean, people don't know. And but it's fun. It's fun to to take that risk. I think DJing is is about taking risks as well. And I mean that 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 gives a, a special magic to the to the night. I think. Yeah. I like magic. We all like magic, definitely. You like magic? Yeah. Okay. Um, Bibi, um, I was wondering what where you look for new music. Oh, um, mostly. Um, I look a lot online, I look a lot on Bandcamp, a lot on Beatport as well, um, uh, a lot on SoundCloud, um, and just like in daily life as well, I can just get inspired while I'm in the car, just listening to, to the radio. Um, I used to work at a, at a store at Carhartt, um, and we had a really good sound system there, and there was a lot of great tunes, and it was like a, some sort of... Um, like a uh, music program um, that was specifically for the store um, and I got a lot of music from there because it was super cool stuff um, and then YouTube I have like a, a ton of YouTube um, um, accounts that I follow that have like very big uh, collections of music um, so yeah mostly on the internet though yeah. I will say yeah do you have any sources to add to that Lola 
for me, I, I, I dig mostly on Discogs. Yeah. And then from there, if I find something nice, I check on YouTube and then I can go to uh, YouTube channels as well, as Bibi mentioned. And also a lot, mostly when I travel, every time when I have time, I go visit record shops because I also just think it's really nice to go see how the local scene works and talk to the people of the record shop and meet uh, people who are also interested in music in every different city and it's even hanging there uh, inspires you already so yeah. yeah to just hang with like-minded people and exchange thoughts and have talks about yeah these things yeah left what's the latest record shop you've been to uh Cosmos Records in Toronto, and uh, um, what's good about it? Uh, Aki, he's Japanese. He knows everything. He knows. He follows me, so he knows exactly what I'm into. So every time he knows I'm in town, I, I walk inside the shop. He's like, "I got some shit for you," and so he takes it out, and it's always the most expensive records. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, and then there's you get a, a reduction. <laughs> yeah, Aki he's, he's a man. He's a man. He's um every everybody every every digger in the world knows Aki. Well, or you should know about him. Japanese are really into digging. They like otaku. They 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 like monomaniacs. Yeah. They, they, yeah, they, they like that stuff. The shops in Tokyo are insane. Insane. Um, and he he deals a lot with Tokyo. Of course, he's Japanese, and. Um, uh, yeah, a few stores in New York, um, uh, and then uh, yeah. Okay. And then yeah, it's a lot of mailbox for me though. Yeah. <laughs> Promos. Promos. Yeah, it's mailbox. It's WhatsApp. It's Instagram DM. It's it's a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. Igmar, do you have anything to add to where to find music, or was it all mentioned? Yeah. Was it all was mentioned? mentioned? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, um, that was part one. Um, part two is about more being more than just a DJ. Uh, in the second part, we examine the various roles a DJ can play next to being a DJ, and we're gonna check one role per uh, mentor of this uh, of this debate. Left, I'm gonna start with you. You recently released an album on uh, Brownswood. Um, how does a DJ relate to being a music producer or a musician? I think it's a logical step some, some, somehow to start by listening to music, then playing the music, and then uh, um, trying to depict some, some of the music samples sometimes. And then from, sam from all the samples that you find from the music you like, you end up maybe producing yourself. And I've been producing for maybe 25 years. A lot of people don't know that because I, it's like very low key. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 a logical. Did you ever evolution? Did you ever study music or an instrument? No, I studied um, intuition. <laughs> no, I didn't study any music. Uh, I learned to play uh, um, uh, just intuitively. Yeah. Um, keys, but. Uh, no, I think it takes a lot of time, and I don't think I have that time. <laughs> Did anyone around the table here study music or an instrument? Anything like it? I, st I, played, I started playing drums when I was eight years old until my 16. Um, yeah, I really liked it, but of course, you know how it goes when you turn 15, 16, you start to have under, other interests in practicing or going to school, like after school, Two, twi uh, two, three times a week. So then I stopped. Uh, I wanted to pick it up, but I don't have time for it. And then I went for a very short time to SIA in Brussels because I wanted to learn how to produce. But yeah, I quit actually quite fast because they don't start from the beginning. They don't start from scratch. And I really didn't have any background. So I said I was going to learn it by myself, but I didn't fully go for it yet so yeah maybe at some point but i don't feel it yet now it feels to me that today the, the dj's craft is is back again very important but there was a time that it was important to also produce music to be able to get gigs is that is that correct is that a correct does anyone can anyone relate to that 
that today it's more again about DJing, DJing, but today, yeah, I think that um, I don't think, for example, that putting out this record gave me more gigs than yeah. I already had. It gave me some live shows, but less than I would have expected. Yeah, and um, that's unfortunate, but it happens. But yeah, I think it's it's a lot about profile these days more than content. Okay. Mm. Yeah, but no one feels like pushed to start making music to get more gigs. That's not that's not how the game goes. No, it's about pushing sometimes your your image. Yeah. <laughs> that sometimes works better. Yeah. It is it is what yeah. it is. I do somehow believe that it would get me more gigs, but uh, that's just speculation actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But you're not making the... <laughs> no, no, yeah, no. Uh -huh. People have been pushing me, man, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. If I got the time. Yeah. Maybe that, that, that's also, you got to put in a lot of time because it's... Uh, you got to do the hours. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's tough times, though. Yeah. Because a lot of people are producing and a lot of DJs as well. So there's there's a lack of a lot of things. So it's it's tough. <laughs> Stuff to get to there's get a lack of clubs and there's a lack of um, uh, venues. Yeah. So some that's what makes it maybe tough to to have enough gigs for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, baby, I know if you've been experimenting also a bit with with, with singing, even with making music. Is, is that something you want to continue doing? Um, yeah, I actually really want to release music as well because um, I think as a DJ, if you release music, I think it would help give you more gigs. Um, I think it would probably um, kind of um, like really put your stamp on the scene. Like, for example, if you look at uh, Marlon Hofstadt, he's super popular because he also makes a lot of his own music. Um, and you can't really, like as a DJ, you can play his music, but people would prefer to see like a Marlon Hofstadt show. So I think it would be nice to um, also put out my own music because when you play for a long time, you also sometimes um, in a lot of songs you hear like, oh, the kick would be, should be harder here or there should be a longer vocal uh, piece here or stuff like that. And that's also why I started doing, um, producing my own stuff. Um, and also because I love singing and I think it would be a nice segue. Um, um, it would also be nice just to uh, kind of create a different atmosphere than what I've been doing right now with playing other people's music, like really put my own stamp on my DJ sets um, so that no one can like copy you in yeah. a way. Um, so I think that's interesting, but as I said, I'm pretty, pretty OCD and pretty perfectionist. So a lot of the stuff has been in the fridge for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I'm really pushing myself um, to release something. Um, and I think there will be something out soon. So yeah. I hope, um, yeah, it would also be nice for me to see the direction, direction of the crowd to my own music because I've been playing like only other people's music now. Um, so I would like to know how that feels as well to yeah. play your own music. Very curious yeah, to yeah. hear it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lola, you run the label Small Steps. Um, how do you see running a label in connection to the craft of DJing? What, what's the connectivity there? For me, it's just like, like as a DJ, you get also a lot of promos of or, or mu unreleased music, and you get a chance uh, of playing them in front of people, and actually you run away with credits then. And I was just thinking when when you have a label, you can actually share your like the visibility with the producers and give them actually a platform to release their music and also get it out there i think they they deserve it and for me i don't i don't know if i will ever produce but at the moment i don't really feel it because i'm more intrigued by finding new music and creating kind of a story or like this is really what I want to achieve, like becoming a DJ who can tell, uh, like play very storytelling and like also help other producers or artists to get there and like yeah. just become like a community or like share your experiences or visibility with others and yeah, share your network. I, yeah, yeah, share the network. I, 
I'm more. I don't need. I don't want more gigs or get more popular. That I'm not interested in that. I just want to create something really honest and yeah, something yeah. that I'm proud of and organically also. What's the hardest part about running a label? For me, it's also the. Con I think the consistency, because it's like, and also like I do it all by myself. And sometimes I get a bit too much stuck in too stuck in my head because like I get I have a lot of like nice music that is actually I don't know what I'm waiting for to bring it out but I'm always doubting like yeah maybe there's something better still or maybe we can still fine tune it a bit and sometimes I'm like or maybe I need to be just make mistakes or take risks because you also learn out of like I don't think that everyone who has a label maybe for like 20 years that they're convinced about all the releases if you release a lot like from the beginning uh, for example I think it's normal to make progress like hopefully to make progress and to yeah to level up like every time But yeah, sometimes I wonder if it would be better if I would have a partner in it yeah. to talk about it. I, I mean, I talk with my friends, but my friends all have different styles. And sometimes I get also really confused because everyone says something else. And then I'm like, oh, no, yeah. I need to follow like my idea and what I want to do. So, yeah. Are you working on a release right now? Yeah, like for next year, it's good. I think we will. I mean, I will try to <laughs> do uh, to I have like three, four releases ready. Okay. So from now, I mean, it took like two, three years to get there because you start with a lot of artists who send you nice music and you believe in it. Or maybe it's one track that you're like 100% behind. But, and then you are like, okay, let's, let's start working together. But it can take some time before you get to an EP or a few tracks that, you are both fully convinced of. So it's since few years that I'm busy with some artists and now now everything comes all together, like it's getting ready and like, yeah, also you build a bigger and bigger network. So I believe from now on thing will, things will get more consistent yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Igmar, you run the Brick Up Brack collective. What was first, the collective for DJ YouTube? Uh, DJing was definitely first. Um, yeah. How did it start, the, the collective? Um, wait, so as it, it came as a, an extension of, of wanting to play the music that I like, for sure. So I started DJing as you, I guess, in 2013. And I started in, in where I grew up, in Limburg. And uh, uh, yeah, obviously, there wasn't really a scene for the music that I, that I liked. And when I came to Brussels, I had this expectation that there would be more of a scene, like either a consistent, a consistent club night or just clubs that would book that music consistently. But that wasn't really the case. So um, yeah, I've, I just took matter in, in my own hands. And um, yeah, I started Prick à Brac kind of by myself. I had some outside help uh, for the first editions, but yeah, the, 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 vision, the, the vision and the creative direction was, was mostly me. And it wasn't until two years later that it actually became a, a collective um, because I wanted, to, I wanted Prick à Brac to be a, a, a platform, not just like a a party series and uh, at that time I was doing my internship at Bruce and I wanted to have a radio show radio show there and I felt like it would be cool if um, like-minded friends or like-minded DJs um, had like could could also consistently share their specific taste within that scene or their specific knowledge or their specific culture within that scene um, Uh, on the radio show as well as on the party so that's how it kind of became a crew of resident DJs um, yeah that was around 2019 and and yeah since then we've been building up so out of that that action out of that resident ID came artists like uh, Osimi, Fahad Seriki, uh, Ravi Bongo, GM, Torito Venti Dosh and then later we also added uh, Bonalea and, and Moni Cashflow And yeah, most of these people were, were not DJing or just started DJing uh, when uh, Brick Abra came around their path. So yeah, it's, it's just a, a, a cool way to grow together and, and to learn from each other as well, musically, but also on, on a human level. So it's yeah, 
it's like lifting each other up and like yeah the main thing is creating that scene just creating a yeah yeah pushing multiple people around the same genres kind of yeah although the genres are still very <laughs> broad within Brickerback even um, yeah that was still kind of the idea okay cool uh, uh, Bibi you promote your own uh, disco sec nights they, they are club nights right um, yeah. you recently had a big one in Rivierenhof in Antwerp with Moody Man yeah how was it it was amazing yeah. yeah it was really it was everything I dreamed of and more it was really nice yeah and why did you start the disco sec nights um, I started mostly um, because I felt like there was a, a lack of, of, of fun and good parties in Antwerp. I felt like the scene was kind of slowly dying. Uh, I still feel like it is um, because we don't have such a nice mayor there who yeah. doesn't really believe in nightlife. Um, so like even one of my favorite clubs, Under Understrom, had to close. Um, I think it's like a year ago now. Um, which was really sucky uh, and I felt like there's a lot of people still like looking where to go um, I think a lot of the nightlife in Antwerp is like focused on, on techno and like very ravey stuff we have Club Vag, which is very dark um, and then we have Soulful Sessions which is also like a very nice house concept but I felt like there was something missing something maybe a bit more imaginative um, I've always been really inspired um, by like Studio 54 and like the old disco gay clubs and like the 80s and people getting dressed up to go out um, and I thought why not try uh, to organize such a night in Antwerp and then uh, Trix offered uh, the location and I first was a big uh, skeptic about it because it's like a concert um, venue mostly um, but it's like a really big black room and it, it worked perfectly actually um, so yeah I'm very happy that we did it and it's it's really working as well I feel like people respond to it super positively I feel like they've all also missed something that's a bit more yeah like I said more imaginative a bit more glamorous and I feel like it's working so I'm happy that I tried it out yeah lovely yeah. sounds great um, <laughs> okay that was part two let's move on to part three uh, I think we have 30 more minutes, right? Something like that. Someone is responsible here, yeah. <laughs> What's happening after that? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. We'll we'll plenty more, voila. Is anyone going to shut us down? <laughs> Finally. Okay. The mayor. Um, no, he's down with us. <laughs> he, he likes us. The, the third part is about um, a promotion and network. Um, being a DJ means putting yourself out there in the offline but also the online world, developing an identity for yourself and actively promoting your activities. You could almost say if it didn't appear on social media, it didn't happen. Um, agree or disagree, Lefto? Well, I think it depends on uh, how big you see your party or how big you want to make it. If you want to make it cozy and stuff then yeah you i mean you don't need the socials you can do it like very could could you be a dj nowadays without social media yeah i think so i think you still can you you can just be a dj and go at bonafoy or dj anywhere and there will be people so you could but it's not the same and it depends how you want to project yourself yeah. As a DJ, if you're just cool playing records and you don't care, or you just want to people, everybody to know what you're doing, so it really it's a it's a way of um, of dealing with it. <laughs> I wonder, you have the longest career of everyone here at the table. Your experience, the start of the internet and social media as a DJ. How did you create an identity for yourself before there was the internet? I went out sticking posters and flyers in the shops stickers <laughs> not for okay. parties but um no mostly posters that was kind of fun to to hang posters on everything i took the inspiration sometimes from what i saw when i i would go to new york where they would stick like <laughs> double posters like around a pole and then you just um how do you say that you just niches yeah. Like, yeah yeah 
and then you, 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 you push it up, and then you put another one, and you push it up, you push it up, and then the whole pole is just full of your posters. And it, it had your name on? or your, Yes, yeah. and uh, not only my name, but the name of the, the party that I used to uh, present in yeah. Ghent a lot. And um, I think that's a cool way of, of, mm, of, of promoting as well. And I think these days... Um, I think when you go to a city and you see posters everywhere in the city, you, you can feel that the city is alive. If the city was super clean, no posters, no graffiti, no nothing, it would feel very sterile. sterile. So I think there is, a, there's a, there's a, there is a charm of seeing posters in the streets. So I think we should go back to that as well. You could do the social part, but it would be nice to have posters. posters. In you print a lot of stickers as well, right? That's also your way to leave. Your yeah, and posters too. I like yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's art in a way. It's, yeah. it's, it's beautiful to do so. Yeah. Lola, do you spend a lot of time on social media working on your DJ profile? I just post when I have content, but actually... Like some DJs, they always ask the the stage manager or like the artist host to make videos. But I always forget also because in the moment I'm not busy with it. But when I have a nice video or I see like someone posting a nice story, um, then I ask them if they can send it. And then I then I post it and I see, of course, like when you do that, of course, it, it gets interact like good interaction and people like seeing that. And but I don't post like after every weekend. Like I post every every month my dates because of course they should know where like people want to follow you or should know where you where you play. And I also also just like making pictures and like analog pictures and stuff. So this I try to integrate in the Instagram page. But I don't know. I think it's it's important, of course, to show where you play. But I don't want to push. Like I try to do it naturally as well. Yeah. Like if I don't have content from the weekends, then like as I said, I like making pictures also when I travel with my phone. So then I try to just make like a random artistic, like artistic in my eyes maybe, but just a, a picture um, with my phone from something random and to to thank the party because that's always nice to just do. And yeah, then I do it like this, but I don't try to. Yeah, over like overdo it or force it. I think it's it's important to just be yourself and do it naturally. If you yeah. like to to post a lot about it every weekend and to interact with people, then you should do it. But if it's not natural, you should yeah. also not force it. Socials are overwhelming too. I think sometimes, and I have this example of today, like Circle Park. We announce a gig, and they are like, "Yo, push that FB event, Facebook event." I'm like. Are we still on Facebook? You know, I, I don't. I'm not on Facebook anymore. I, I don't do shit on Facebook. I don't post on Facebook anymore. So I don't even know if it's essential to do it. You know, so I'm, I'm sometimes lost in the social sphere. There's a lot of pressure from from promoters though to to push the events on social media as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And especially if you're not used to do it anymore, yeah. it even feels more pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't mean that. There's two thousand people attending. That it's you know that there's going to be two thousand. Yeah. But I agree that if you see two thousand, it might maybe maybe um, excite maybe you. Exci no, excite the people to maybe yeah, well, to go. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Like True. I want to be part of that. Yeah. Uh, Igmar, often social media are being diabolized for having a negative effects. They are addictive and part of a capitalist system. How do you deal with the negative side of social media, if there is any for you? <laughs> it's more coping, I guess. Than yeah. <laughs> but being on social media can also be cope, a coping mechanism for other shit. Um, yeah. Because it is, it is an addiction. It is something that gives you dopamine. Uh, the shitty part is that I do use it as part of my my uh, this job, like promoting parties, promoting myself as a DJ. So um, yeah, you. I'm not the person to ask how to handle that because I'm not the best at it yet. But um, yeah, I do feel like it is still important to to use it definitely as a as a beginning DJ. Like uh, you should show other promote yeah, you should show promoters or clip owners what you do. It's just so hard to not get lost in the sea. Uh, 
at this point, you almost have to be a good content creator to make content that uh, grabs the attention, because that's that's the currency on 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 social media. Um, so yeah, it's it's tough, man. <laughs> it's an online it's misleading. C it's misleading. It's misleading. Too but it's an online CV as well. It's it's like yeah. it's yeah, a website. Instagram is like your portfolio now. But, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, but it's misleading because yeah, yeah it can definitely. like promoters sometimes they take the best the best atmosphere of your best gig, mm. and they like. This guy is coming, or this girl is coming. It's gonna do this, yeah. and it's gonna be like that. And then the you go, night. and then and then they go, and they're like, "Well, where's the vibe? <laughs> it's not like on the video." Yeah, and that just depends on so many factors. Yeah, true. Yeah, the internet is also a giant sea of online mixes, and some platforms are highly important to make a DJ career, such as Boiler Room or Her. What do you think, Bibi? Uh, how, how important are or have been those kind of DJ mixes for you? Um, for other DJs? For, for you, me, no, specifically. Um, what do you mean my set being on yeah, there? Yeah. Uh, I expected more, honestly. <laughs> I thought it was going to do the boiler room. Yeah, I thought it was going to do a bit more, but um, in the end, I'm 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 happy with 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 the set that I with a, that I did, and I'm happy that the moment is documented, and I'm happy that. Um, if people want to know what I what I do, that there's like a um, a platform or a set that they can look back at, because um, I'm proud of it. Um, but in the moment, I thought, oh, now everything is going to happen. Um, my first boiler room, it was like one of my bucket list things. Um, and then I was super stressed, uh, like full of adrenaline, and I I don't even remember like like. Right after I came off the stage, I don't even remember what I did because it was so stressed. Um, but then looking back at it, it's like, yeah, it was just a set and it's it, it was filmed, so it's nice. But for me personally, I I took a lot of inspiration from like a lot of boiler room sets. For example, like DJ Ezet's boiler room set is one of my favorites ever, and like Honey Dijon's boiler room set as well. Like that that's where it started for me was on those platforms. So yeah. Maybe that's why I thought for me it was going to do more as well, but it didn't in the end. But I'm also not disappointed about it. It's just like, yeah, it just happened. And I feel like there's there's so many sets online as well. And Boulder Room does so much and there's so much content. And people really have to like dig through stuff to 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 find you, I feel like. So yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit double, but um, yeah. There's a lot out there. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. Was yeah. it for you the same, Lola? Does it, or did it make a difference? You did her as well, I think, and, and Boiler yeah. Room? I think it made a difference, but it was not like straight, straight away. But yeah. I think it's always, yeah, it's, it's good to have these things out. And of course, it creates visibility. But like Bibi says, it's like so stressful and also like after Boiler Room because it was my second Boiler Room I did and I was like, now I don't want to do it for like next 15 years because I don't know, like I'm also happy about it and it got a lot of visibility and good reactions, but it's also like your music style develops so much and changes so much and it's a journey to get to your own sound. And if I listen to my her set, I think it was a good consistent set at that moment, but I would, I'm not playing it anymore at yeah. all now, this kind of music. And sometimes, like uh, Lefto says, like promoters use snippets from that set from four years ago, or like even from the boiler room from six years ago. And I'm like, I really, <laughs> Don't, I'm, my music now is not aligned with that at all anymore. So it can be dangerous as well. But of course, if it gets a lot of views, for example, then people start following you. And if they like it, they will maybe follow you through the whole journey. So even when you change, some people will start following what you do and stick with you because of that first big thing or big mix that you did. Yeah. So obviously it helps and it also keeps you busy, at least for me, every time when you have like a new goal that you have to prepare for. Like otherwise, I don't know, I think it's good to challenge myself and especially if you want to play, learn how to play like, like build a, um, yeah, like storytelling or something, 
of course it happens in the moment in the vibe as well how you feel at the moment but i think also you learn a lot from preparing at home and trying out some mixes that you maybe would not there on the spot and then out of this transition that you prepared for a kiosk or for a hur or or a boiler room or whatever then you play this use these two also in other sets live and uh, yeah i think it just helps you as well to always have like this smaller uh, new pro like this new project you know, yeah okay to prepare yeah you also all do uh, radio shows. Um, Lefto, I wonder, you recently celebrated your thousandth radio show here at Kiosk. Online. Online. My thousand online. Yeah, which is an incredible number. You ran a, a show at Studio Brussels before, which is, you know, the, 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 the huge station with uh, several hundred thousand uh, listeners. Still? Still. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you move from, from that place to kiosk, from the big one to the, the small new online player? Because I, I, I felt there was no real support for what, what I and some of other shows actually had to off, offer. And I, I actually did quite well doing it. It was nice. I mean, they all hated me for it. But coming to kiosk after and just right before COVID was perfect. Because I remember all the other DJs at, at the Studio Brussels having to do their shows from home or being all alone in the in the office at Studio Brussels while we could still do the radio show here at Kiosk and have a little crowd at least, sometimes with a little distance. But no, um, I just felt that there was no support and, and they still wanted to give me those two hours in the evening, but it's like a ghost down there in the evening. So I just, you know, I... I come from a, a time at Studio Brussels where I had my own technician, where I could come in with a full band and go into the studio and set up a full band and have a good live show to just doing a show with Gus and a few spiders, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, well, it went all downhill from, from a certain yeah. point. And the support I get from Kiosk uh, from the beginning, I've basically never had it from Studio Brussels. Yeah. Well, I got paid, but that's all, you know. Fuck yeah. the money. I, I don't do it for the money. No. But, yeah, Kiosk is the one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, product placement. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Igmar, when, when, when looking at your career so far, uh, can you point out a pivotal moment when an, an event or a certain story that got attention, that it pushed you forward? Yeah, I thought about that question, but I don't really have like one one uh, moment that was like, ah, uh, now all of a sudden p people perceive me in such a way. So no, actually, no, no, not one pivotal moment. Okay, <laughs> wrong question. Uh -huh. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, that's all for this part. I have one more, two more, but I don't think it's. I think it's gonna take a bit long. So probably one more part. Um, and that seems a bit like a downer to end the conversation, but anyway, I want to go into the, to it anyway. Uh, it's it's about the downside of DJing, the stress, the anxiety, maybe the hedonism that comes along the job. Uh, DJs are at the center of attention during a party. You're often alone on stage with all clubbers on the dance floor oriented towards the DJ. DJs are often working during the night. They often, often travel alone, um, and while working, most other people in the room are in a kind of hedonistic, hedonistic state of mind. I wonder, Bibi, what's the hardest part of being a DJ for you? Whew. That's a difficult question. I don't know. I think for me, it's, um, I self-criticize a lot, maybe. Um, and I think the hardest part of being a DJ is um, to keep your energy high at all times, because sometimes you're just tired and you don't want to be in a club. From, from four till six, you just want to go home and sleep because you had a very busy weekend. Um, traveling alone? Traveling alone as well. I really, in the beginning, I sucked at it. I, I, I hated it also. But meanwhile, I was super grateful that I got to play like in different countries and different, different places. But I had just had too much expectations, really. I always thought like, oh, now I'm booked in, in Sweden, so it's going to happen. I'm going to, you know, they're going to know me there and they're just going to party. But sometimes you just 
you fly to Sweden and it's a bad show, you know? And you really have to um, lower your expectations and that's the way that I um, got to enjoy it eventually. Now also, if I travel alone, I like it more because it's like, um, like the, the, the work itself is super busy and you're super overstimulated, um, but the travel part is like calm, relax, if you don't have delays or <laughs> if everything goes right. Um, you just have a moment to yourself, you know, because there's so many eyes looking at you every time and you always have to like perform and you have to um, really deliver and sometimes I struggle with that because yeah. I'm not always in the mood and I'm not I'm a very emotional person as well and I feel sometimes people can pick up on that um, when I'm feeling low the energy is low the set maybe be a bit more low and when you're feeling good and you're confident the set is also good and you know people believe you more it's all about energy so um, yeah I struggled with that a lot in the beginning. It's about but keeping the balance and yeah, resting yeah. a lot. And resting a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> Did you, uh, Lola, ever encounter anxiety before or during a DJ set? Not really before. Uh, not really while, actually. But I suffered a lot from anxiety before. and Like, I don't know if it was during the weekends, but I actually had, like, a lot of anxiety during the week when I was at home especially when I started to be full-time DJ because during the week all your friends and everyone have a job from like nine to five, for example, and you're at home, but you need to rest. But on the other hand, I felt guilty when I was resting and not digging 24-7 or like every, like from nine to five, for example. And this, I was putting like a lot of stress on myself, like that I had to work all, every moment that I was off for a bit or that I had time that I had to dedicate it to my DJing and if I would not do that I would like yeah be mad at myself for that and this was causing anxiety and that I was blocking because if you treat yourself like this or or think like this you also and you're not relaxed you completely block and then you there's no room for creativity or to get inspired so um, I try to be more relaxed <laughs> about that and and yeah also as BB said it changed a lot with because when you just start touring you think like oh every show will be great but in Belgium people maybe know you but out there like outside of Belgium they don't know you yet so often you get like the beginning slots and no one will come for you because they don't know you maybe there will be more people for like the locals because they bring their friends and then when they're done and you start they stop and you can really start doubting yourself but yeah actually I tried to play also for myself now and I'm just happy to play the music that I love and I try to see it like this <clears throat> when when there's not a lot of people in the room I just try to see it like okay let's just make a party for myself uh, of it, yeah. Yeah, don't take it personally. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Left to did you ever feel stressed about a set? <laughs> yes. Yeah? Well? I think the worst case scenario is being in front of a huge crowd and realizing that what you're doing is not what they want. Yeah. It happens, you know, and sometimes it's just a promoter who decided to put you there because he likes you, but don't get that the DJ that just banged the shit right before you is misleading the crowd yeah. because what you do is not what he does. And then you get there and then your first song and people are like, harder, harder, come on, you just played harder. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. So yeah, it's it's really... It's such a bad feeling to be in front of a huge crowd yeah. that just doesn't like you. Yeah. Or the music, at least. You and know? then it's just well, two hours of... It's sad. It's yeah. actually sad because sometimes it's just a promoter who wanted to experiment, but he's not the one there. You, yeah. know? you are the one who's actually having anxiety, not him. He's like, oh, cool, I booked him because I like him. But everybody hates you. Or well, not hating, but, yeah. you know, that's a bit, like, trash. Hate, maybe not hate, but it's sad. But it doesn't happen often. Yeah. Like, maybe once every 10 years. Yeah. 
that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Happened three times for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, Igmar, how do you find peace of mind and relaxation after a weekend out DJing? Yeah, I don't see this. <laughs> um, yeah, peace of mind. Uh, I'm a rather peaceful person, and my stan standard mindset is peaceful. <laughs> so I guess yeah. it comes quite natural. Um, yeah, just what, what I do sometimes struggle with is like you're on such a high when you DJ. Like it's such a privilege to to do that to you know conduct a crowd into. Uh, ecstasy if you're lucky if you're such a good DJ um, but then afterwards the down can sometimes feel like yeah like a down you might just not feel the same high of course it doesn't last super long um, but then gratefulness is what comes in place for me it's just yeah again think about how privileged you are to be able to, be able to do that so that gives me a lot of yeah peace of mind yeah BB one question for you how do you deal with the constant availability of alcoholic beverages and, and other substances at parties um i like to party myself but when i play i only drink two drinks it's my maximum i never yeah. i don't want to be drunk when i mix because yeah. i like to be in control and whenever i feel drunk i get anxiety and then i think fuck people are gonna notice that i'm drunk and uh I might be a bit more um, like loose and, and try more stuff, but sometimes like after I think like, oh no, what the fuck did I do? So I never get drunk, but um, yeah, sometimes it's hard because also after a big gig, for example, you really want to like wind down because yeah. there's so much stress and there were so many eyes looking at you. You just want to, you know, let go and... and I like to party also, so sometimes I might take it too far and then I'm, I'm too tired for the next day, you yeah. know. Um, so it's a bit of a struggle for me. I'm still figuring it out. Like, I'm not, I'm not um, like, straight edge. I, I would never, like, not drink anything. But it's like a balance that you have to find and you have to know your own limits. And, yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I'm, I'm like, why did I drink more than I was intended to? But I'm glad that I never get drunk while I DJ. Because yeah. that's like one of the... If I start doing that, then I think it would be over for me. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah like really lose control. To, yeah. yeah, I really try to keep that part, you know, yeah. safe. So. Yeah. Yeah. Left to you never, you never, you never drunk, right? In your life, I mean, I never drank. I don't know what it feels to be drunk. No, no, never want to know what what happens in the in the minds of people in front of you. No, I've seen a lot of my friends being so fucked up that I never really wanted to be yeah. fucked up <laughs> like them. Yeah. And I don't want to know what I'd, I'd be doing if I was drunk. Who knows? I might be very bad. I might, I might harass people. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. I don't. I don't want to know, and it's a bit late to know now. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I don't feel the the, the need to. I'm natural high. When I play music, I'm totally in my zone. I play super loud that I feel like I'm in the record. Some people might know that, huh? <laughs> I play super loud, so I, I, I I'm in the zone. <laughs> I'm in the zone, and I just really when I'm finished with my last song, I just get sucked out of that zone, and then I'm, yeah. I feel very like tired usually because yeah. then there's a certain concentration that you have that you yeah no I've never been drunk and left or comes from Celeveto right yeah. yes early yeah. bird early bird yes yeah. <laughs> natural high I think that's a nice uh, maybe ending of this conversation I like I like the idea of a natural high anyway um, in the park Sorry? In the park? In the park. It's nice. Completely. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? We have uh, a bit more time to listen to your questions. There is a microphone that you can use and we can unmute if you need to. Yeah. If someone has... Also, questions. I'm going to pee real quick because I really have to. <laughs> so no, no questions for Ingmar? Someone else wants to pee? No, sorry. I mean, questions? Gerard? You have a few questions. <laughs> no, it's unmuted. Which one is it? Which one? Wait. Let's try them all. Try, Gerhard. Hello. Maybe there's a switch on the microphone. 
Use my. Try it, try it, try it. Try the other one, one, two, three. Ah, yeah, it works. Whatever. That was not me. Okay, I would rather stay in my chair, but anyways. <laughs> so, I actually have a few questions. What are you um, going to sing today? <laughs> so, <laughs> Bruder, yeah, no, just Ooh. Um, so, a lot of you said that you were generally shy. So, how do you guys feel about playing in front of a crowd and people like watching you? Because I know back in the day, you know, like back back in the day, DJs were really like in the back of the crowd um, or like hidden even playing, and they were not really the center of attention. And like, how do you deal with that? Me or I don't know, just um, anyone. Uh, I still struggle with it, um, even though I used to. Uh, I always was in art school. I used to do theater, and I, I my dream was to be an actress. But at around sixteen, I I I didn't like to be perceived anymore. Um, and even now, sometimes I'm in front of a, a big crowd, and I look up, and I'm like, shit, fuck. Where am I, you know? So, um, but then I just started to focus on my music a bit more. And I, I one time I played after, uh, no, before Mr. G, who was like also a big, a big uh, um, inspiration of mine, a DJ I looked up to. So I was super nervous before. Uh, and he was dancing, and after he said, like, your set was great, but look up more and smile. So every time I, I DJ, like, He's in the back of my mind, like, look up and smile. And it really does wonders, um, because when you see, like, a big crowd, it's like a big sea of people, but when you actually look at, like, the separate persons and you smile at them, it's it's a bit less overwhelming. So that's what I try to do. But it still gets, like, heavy. You had a second question, right? Wow, I have one, two, three, I have five. I have five. Uh, yes, I was listening. Um, also, like a lot of genres, like for example, Brick Brock is very well known for like the genres that you guys play. Left was kind of more like multidisciplinary. Lola is like also a bit housey. I feel like personally, and then you are more disco. How do you deal with like the typecasting of of dealing with like okay, you are always booked because you play disco. You are always booked because you play this. You are always booked because you play this. But if you want to get out of this genre, how do you like, do you want to get out of the genre or do you want to stay in this genre because you know it so well? Like, how do I, you... I think they sometimes that? put you in a certain position where you just have to play that genre. It depends on the lineup. Mm. Like if you put me on a, on a lineup where it's mostly house and, or, and techno, for example, I'm not going to play jazz usually. Like if it's an open format night, then you, I'll, I'll do it all. But I try to stick to the concept usually. Yeah. So if you want me to play you... Latin for two hours, I'll play Latin for two hours. If it's techno, I'll play two hours of techno. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. So that's cool. Yeah, but it would be nice if like there would be like more open-mindedness uh, with promoters. Like book book a book a house DJ on a whatever break up back night. I might actually do that at some point. You want to come? No. Um, but I, I'm playing around. But um, yeah, I think yeah, the typecasting is definitely a thing. But it's true. Like sometimes people put you in that position without like, yeah, without maybe properly listening or, yeah. I think also that like as a DJ, you should not limit yourself or in one genre. I think it's important that you create your own identity in terms of emotions also or kind of vibe, and that you can play different kind of genres but that every dj has his own style and own yeah like emotion or vibe how they bring stuff and this is where you stand for and i think even sometimes when i play a bit harder or like softer or deeper there's still always like this red line that I, like of emotion that i bring in every set so i think you can play whatever you want as long that it's yeah, in the um, the the story that you want to tell. There's, but there's then then there there comes another problem to it. I think when an agent, your agent, tells you that while well, it's hard, they have a problem booking me, for example, because the promoter doesn't know what you'll be bringing. Like 
you play too many genres. We don't know. We can put you in a box. And these days, I think it's really hard for a DJ who you can't put in a box to to have the gigs that you would like to have, just because you just want don't want to be in that box and you was, have to deal with it. Was that differently before? Because you've always been an eclectic, known for eclecticism. Maybe you were more known for like the hip hop realm, uh, everything around that. But you've it's always been eclectic. Was it easier like back in the day? A little bit, I guess. I had I was a little less um, versatile. Like I, I tried to stick to everything that was related to hip hop. Slightly going into house, but then when you were into the hip hop vibe, then and you would start playing a little bit of house, all that crowd would be like, "What is he doing? What's this guy?" But um, yeah, over the years, it's just like with the experience and just uh, the, the different influences, you just start playing a lot of different stuff. And some people still see you as a hip hop DJ. Some people see you as someone who plays a lot of different stuff. So, but yeah, it's, it's tough in this world where when you play different genres of music to, to find, yeah, to find that little road where you can play all that stuff. But, and also, it doesn't make sense because if I talk to a lot of upcoming DJs, they all want to play more. They they, they want to stick to one genre. But I feel like maybe promoters should. It, it, I, I kind of that's what I want to say. I hope that there will be more open format parties. That would just be way more fun. But everyone starts usually with one genre. That's their first genre. If they just new to the game, it's what they play. Um, a lot of the younger DJs who who start playing uh, hard techno, for example and they have to do an opening set where it's still going to be 140 hard techno. You come into the room and there's like five people and it's like, <laughs> you know? Mm. So I don't know, it's just, um, it's, it's a whole new, it's a, it, there's a, it's a different thing these days. There's less maybe the, the art of having an opening DJ playing softer, just opening and then building towards the night, like playing harder, towards deep in the night and then at the end also maybe slowing down or go go a little deeper sometimes it's just the same from the beginning to the end it's very linear and that that's a little thing that we miss maybe these days in parties it's just that the, the art of opening a party and the art of closing a party and everything in between can be part of your mentorship here in this uh, dex education program i guess maybe yeah more questions I'll just ask one more, <laughs> and then I'll leave. Um, so, uh, like, there's a lot of now summer. There's a lot of day parties again, and in the winter it's usually like club season, and it's like nighttime, and so it's just a rapid fire. Like, what is your favorite time to play? Like daytime or nighttime? Daytime. I like nighttime more. <laughs> I just don't like to play like in the daylight. I mean, it depends if you're honest. I just don't like to be on a stage. And often when it's like in festival, you're like on a big stage and very exposed. And I just like to play in a club where everything is a bit like foggy and mysterious. And then I can jump more like in the role of like yeah, controlling the room. I have the feeling instead of when I'm standing there and everyone sees you so but i also like day parties but it depends my favorite time is six to eight on a sunday in the park <laughs> if i could <laughs> at kiosk radio if i could get paid for that gig every week every weekend i would probably not party or gig uh, on another day i would just do the sunday slot and paid for my two hours set and I would be happy not doing any night gig or anything else. Just those two hours. It's good Exclusive. enough. Exclusive, yeah. And that if people want to see you, they need to just come. Easy. Um, if you would let me do completely my thing, I think if a, in a one hour set I would play 45 minutes, only soulful stuff and that probably works best uh, during daytime in the summer. Um, so that would be my favorite. But I like clips as well. Uh, some dark shit. Thank you. Who's next? <laughs> Thank you for being here, guys. It's nice.
Ouais. Hello. Euh, Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, so thank you for the conference. It was very interesting. I have a question because I I have a problem recently. <laughs> like, so I DJ myself and I'm kind of struggling with people that behave bad during my sets and it affects, affects me a lot. And I've been discussing it with my agents, with some friends. And so I would like to know how do you deal with this? Because I don't, I'm not sure it's going to stop. Well, people sleeping on the decks, people touching us, people, I don't know, too drunk, too uh, high. And yeah, it, uh, it, it's really hard for me these times. So because I don't drink during my sets, so I'm not in the same mood. And I'm like super sad sometimes when I come home at 7 a.m. and, you know, Uh, fronting people that behaved so bad with me, sometimes being so disrespectful. So I want to know if you get to a point that you don't care or if you find some solutions uh, for you not be too affected about that. Uh. <laughs> I think it's also part of the DJing. Like, you are like working in an environment where people get sometimes extremely drunk or high and act bad and I can imagine I can I can also really it can really affect me and I think it's part of it but most to for yourself to give it a place I think if something is really bothering you that is really like going too far that it's very important to address this to the promoter and that they address it to the person themselves. I don't think it's professional if you do it straight away. I mean, depends, of course, on what they do. But I think for yourself and for your peace of mind, it's also nice if you feel that the promoters, for example, if take care of it and that you are in safe hands and that they will make sure some kind of things don't happen again. Mm -hmm. But people who are drunk and sometimes behave wrong or bump into the boot, it's... I can also, especially when you're tired, it can really work on my nerves so badly, but that's just how it goes. Yeah, yeah. my you mom should. says that I'm too serious <laughs> sometimes. No, I you mean, should, you yeah. should always be protected as a DJ because you're, you're doing your job. Uh, you're trying to, for the, in, in, in the club or whatever place it is, you should always be protected by the promoter or security somehow, mm -hmm. even if you're just in the crowd. But there should always be someone that just makes sure that everything's all right. There should always be someone next to you. Let's, let's say that you need to go pee, which can happen, or you're very, you're, you're very thirsty, or I don't know, you have, a, you have a sugar low level. So there should be always someone that's taking care of you. Um, yeah. So it's, it would be nice for you as well to when before, before the gig starts that you even ask the promoter, can you please have someone next to me because this or that happened in the past. Um, I have an example of um, uh, Jada G, who, she, well, you know her, and she used to have a stalker. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, and so, so the, 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 the agent always sent the same picture of that same guy who always stalked her, like at, at every gig. So they put that face at the entrance and made sure that guy never entered. So yeah, it happens, but I think it's the responsibility of the promoter who booked you to make sure you're in, in safe hands. Yeah. You should never be afraid to, to speak up. And I'm sorry it happens to you so much. It's no, just... I mean, you know, I think it happens to every DJs, but maybe I'm taking it a bit too personally sometimes. No. But it happened a I lot recently, so... Once uh, someone threw a full cup of beer to my head. <laughs> it happened <laughs> to I me really too. And I really thought I was playing a good set, but apparently they thought differently. And I really cried. I cried and I, I, I told the security guy, like, straight away, like, someone through a cup because it like disrupts the whole vibe even like when you think you're doing a good job it's just so aggressive it's so barbaric almost you know so you should really always speak up and, and make sure that there's people around that can can help and don't be afraid See, that, that's why I'm never drunk because how men behave sometimes it's it's I feel sorry for you how men sometimes behave when they're drunk yeah especially for female DJs like there's some guys recently who asked me if I needed their, them help <laughs> while I was playing yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, and it happens a lot, you know, touching it, my arms, yeah. saying yeah. some shit, touching my deck and everything. And I'm like, yo, dudes, I don't need that. You know, I'm just trying to be focused. It's fucking 6 a.m. So it, it yeah. can happen to everyone, but I think it happens a lot to, to women in the DJ game. I think so. Um, I've had an experience where I'm, I was DJing and, the, and in a kind of boiler room setting. And this woman was standing in the back and she was constantly grabbing my balls. Oh, no. <laughs> and so I, I stopped the music and, I, and, and I, I grabbed the mic and I said, can you stop touching my balls or grabbing my balls? And the woman was very like, oh, shit. And then I played the music again and then she was gone. Mm. Sometimes you have to, if you have the, the, the balls to do it, <laughs> you sometimes just grab the mic and you stop everything. And you say, no, this is enough. Uh, I don't tolerate those kind of things. And maybe the promoter will hear it or security mm. and you say like, yo, this guy, go. You know, okay. I mean, it's it's I'll try. it's only if you if you if if it pisses you you off so hard that you just you just have to do it. Yeah, sometimes because otherwise it's super hard to be focused again on what you're doing, and when the vibe is broken, then it's broken for the old set, right? So, okay, thank you for your advices. It should never Good happen. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Take your dog with you. Yeah. It will help. <laughs> <laughs> It will, it will help you in the club. <laughs> Grab him. Any more questions? Two more? I think you were first, right? You were waiting already a bit. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, um, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so, the question is more, I, I'm not even sure if it's a question, or more like a discussion point kind of thing. How do you, um, because I also heard from two friends over there, also DJ with me, um, the always the question of finding your sound how do you find it for me often it is more running away from sounds instead of searching for something it's running away from what I just found because it feels like often when it gets more commercial or popular I am like uh, you, know, you need to find something a bit more niche is it working? Yeah. maybe it's like closer closer close like this yeah, okay. um yeah, so the, my, my question was, how do you deal when, when you find a sound that you like, but you also see that this sound is getting more and more popular around, and you kind of want to be like, no, not, not that commercial. You don't want to sell it too much in that way because it becomes a bit too popular to the point that you don't want to kind of mix with the things that you normally don't find that cool, let's say. I also don't find commercial music bad, but let's say I want to try to do something different. So how do, you do, how do you deal with that when it gets too popular, let's say? I recognize myself in that, but also you shouldn't give, you should just care about what you like, man. If you like the music, then that's the most important thing, according to my opinion. But yeah, I get the struggle. Okay. It always sucks when the industry takes over your underground, you know? <laughs> that's all I can say. So I started with hip hop in the, in the beautiful golden era of the 90s, where hip hop was just very underground, but very, very, very good and very deep. And then I saw the industry take over and, and, and basically tell producers how to produce a certain sound to make everybody happy or having to work with certain producers because those were the producers in that moment. And so the industry started to tell people how to produce. And that's around the time that I started to feel very disappointed in the artists that I like. So basically I left it, I left it for a minute. And then gradually I started to listen or I saw people coming out of that bubble again and do very creative stuff in hip hop again as well. And without the exposure, so I started to play those ones again, and I left that one genre that today is the biggest music genre in the world, hip hop. And um, I just play the ones that I like, and I mix it up with different things that I like as well. Okay, because I, I also, like I do have some, some friends that DJ at higher levels and me and my friends are like basically beginners. I also struggle with the fact that some people try to search for the most underground stuff around just because it's underground and completely unknown. And I also don't necessarily think it, it it's worth it. I mean, maybe you don't even like what you're doing, but it's just, you know, no one knows it. So it's cool. So do you do you, do you have this? Like you search for something that is unknown just because it's unknown and like the, the most, like the more niche, the better it is. But it's definitely completely wrong to 
just look for something that no one has because no one has it but that you don't like it then it's wrong i think of course it's really it's good to find music that I mean, it, it's a style. You can dig very deep and find music that no one else has, but of course it needs to resonate completely with what you want to do. You don't need to do it to be to be cool or whatever. I, and I think you can also, you can play just whatever you want and you can also play a track that other people also play a lot, but if you mix it up with other stuff that no one else plays, like I don't believe that like every single track uh, you have, for example, that will be taken over by commercial scene. Like maybe you have other stuff as well, and it's all how you bring it. You like twenty DJs can play all the same track in a completely different style, and that it still fits in your sound. So I think it's more about like how you want to bring it, and of course doing the effort of finding something special. But you, yeah, it's also how you bring it. Yeah. Okay. You are different. You are different than your friends. That's for so, sure. You know. <laughs> what kind of music are you talking about, actually? So the the I think that the example I was referring to is that like when I started DJing a few years ago, I would say like four or five years ago, but like very amateur level house parties, friends, whatever. Um, I was. I think it was the beginning of the peak of melodic techno which at the moment i can't even listen to because it's extremely repetitive like i heard it everywhere literally you open instagram and you find it everywhere because it's just the thing that is most at least like most i would say mainstream most in big numbers and, and stuff and at the beginning i found it really nice i was like oh these sounds are cool but literally i reach a point where i can't hear them anymore like literally so that that was a bit like one of the examples that i had but it applies also to hard techno like like the heavy techno now that is going on it's really like tiktok kind of vibe often and not not to judge but like it gets a bit too much like i don't want to be part of that also because i think there is a sort of a political position for me like certain genres belong to a certain type of like people and, and environment and like behaviors as well so when it gets to people that sort of don't necessarily understand that vibe, then it completely gets ruined. You go to a party, you're like, that's not what I expected at all. So what do you do now? Uh, search and see what... Actually, I think that what, I, what I'm doing now, it's trying to find every set that I'm playing with my friends over there. Um, every time is a different set with actually different music. And I, I went back to see what was my first set after six sets is completely different, like higher BPM, uh, way more vocals, way more groovy and dancey while the first sets were more like sort of flat and more like boom, boom, boom. So I don't know what I play, honestly. Do, like, do I really you, don't know how to answer this question. Do you know what you like? Yeah, do you, I, do you I, know I do your know. Tastes? I think I know what I what kind of an, like vibe I like, but it doesn't apply to one genre. So it could be a bit of then don't softer play, and yeah, harder. Then don't so. play one genre. Exactly. Sometimes it's interesting to go back in history. Right. If you like melodic techno from a few years ago, try to go down to the source of it. That's mm -hmm. like, and and from that source, you can maybe go to to different branches of that as well. Sometimes okay. I do that, like when I'm bored of one style, I just go back, I go all the way to the roots of it, and it might take me to some other places. Okay, this is a, this is a good advice. Yeah. Thank you, thank you You're very welcome. much. <laughs> all right, we had one more question, I think, here. Um, so my question is about social media. Um, a lot of DJs who are starting out um, and some who are doing it <coughs> professionally are balancing with other activities. You know, you can be a DJ and a cook, a DJ and, a, and love hiking or love story writing. And um, I mean, personally, I, I feel like um, I, I feel difficulty having multiple activities coming out on one social media page, but then also don't feel comfortable stretching it out on two or three different um, social media platforms at the same time. Do you feel comfortable and free to express different passions and tastes on one social media platform? Yes. <laughs> but what do you mean the fact that you have other things than just DJing? Yeah, like a mix. And I, I suppose you could also apply the question to 
balancing your personal life if you want to share it on social media and then the more professional aspects of what you're doing on a day-to-day? -day? Is that easy or...? Well, there is this thing with um, DJs who do it like in a professional way and, and everyone else is called a hobby kid where you know everyone just wants to be DJ because it's fun and um, but I think honestly that you if you're a DJ in in many ways you could like a lot of different stuff that's also maybe in that branch of art and culture and I think DJing is part of a culture that is maybe a lot wider it could even be street culture it could be photography it could be uh design it could be graffiti in um, let's say hip-hop for example in the 90s it was like about five disciplines and they were all totally different one was graffiti one was um was one was um uh turntablism, one was breakdancing, one was just uh, producing and DJing in general. So those were already a lot of different uh, things that we would do back then. So I don't see really the problem by um, showing your other skills or other things that you like to bring to the art that you do. I don't know. Yeah, I also don't think you should be afraid to combine it because it makes you more of a... Um, sometimes I struggle with it as well because I feel like my page is only like gigs and, and like photos of of places, uh, of videos of places where I played. Sometimes I feel like people react to like, um, for example, you just have a picture with your niece or something or a picture of your photography. It makes you more human in a way and it's more easy for people to connect with you on like a, a human level and less than like um, for example like a, a performance or like an artist type level you know I think it's important to incorporate as much as like you can of your humanity in your in your in your Instagram account or your social media I think it makes you more likable and more real in a way so you, d you don't think it's confusing for people who are looking you up or trying to book I'm, you for something I mean it it I'll be honest, sometimes if I post something that doesn't has to have to do anything with DJing, I feel like a lot of people unfollow me, but you should like not care about that, you know? If if the people that want to see what you do are interested in what you do, they will stick around and they will, you know, like every part of what you post and you want those to be on your page. So I think you should not be afraid to combine everything. But I also think, like for the example that you used, if you are a chef and a DJ and you take both very serious, if you do it at some uh, certain level, like one of the two, I think it's cool that you show that you have other interests, but I also think like, if you have a DJ profile and, and you like cooking or you are also a chef, that it's, yeah, it's nice for the followers to see it because it creates like sort of like kind of humanity that you're not just uh, one like form of yourself. But I also think you should not overdo it too much. If it's really like two big different passions that you can integrate it. But I also think that if it's really like this, not just a few times that you show your personal life, but really another passion of you deeply that you also want to yeah, grow into that maybe it can get confusing, yes. But it's, of course, it won't hurt to to show it a bit. I can give an example, um, like Action Bronson. <laughs> he's a famous rapper from New York, and he's a very good chef as well. And uh, he has a TV show where he basically goes in different uh, restaurants to taste the food. And um, and um, yeah, people know him as someone who likes food and shows you the best spots to go eat. But at the same time, he does the biggest festivals where he just comes and wraps his great tracks that he has. And it's not a problem at all. And using the same alias, like the same. Same, yeah. yes. And um, the only thing he doesn't do is show his more personal life like his wife and kids and stuff. Because still, some people find it very intrusive. They like to keep social media as far away as uh, from their kids or even me, sometimes posting my kid, I I get a text message from from mom. <laughs> and be like, yo, can you take it off please? Or I went to Paradise City with my son this weekend and I see 
pictures everywhere for my son, so she's a bit pissed at me now. But at the same time, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, I couldn't leave him at home. Cute kid, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> all kids are cute, I think. Especially if it's yours, you know, you think it's cute, even if he's ugly, ugly you know. Yeah. Uh, also, ah. if, if if you have if you have uh, a page where you combine different passion, passions, it can also be it could be an opportunity to I don't know create some content that combines the two in one I don't know if you're if you have energy for that. <laughs> But yeah. thank you. All right, I think uh, we're good tonight. Thank you all for coming and thanks uh, to my guests here. Um, yeah, that's it for tonight. Thank you, Kuhn, for the moderation. Amazing. Thank you guys for coming. Is it okay, guys? You, you seem very like... <laughs> well, some motivation. It is uh, Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. I understand, but come on. Thank you so much for being here. What's next, by the way? There's going to be other things. Yeah, yeah. there's going to be... Yeah. Uh, thanks go. thanks yeah. again uh, to uh, everybody here for doing this great uh, panel talk. This was part one of Dex Education. Uh, there is a second part coming. Uh, the Our four mentors here, BBSEC, Lola Howe, Left to Early Bird, and Youth Youth, um, will take care of four nominees in October. So an open call will follow next week where everybody can apply. Uh, well, it's mostly for younger people, I would say 17 to 24, but no experience required. Um, you can submit a mix and choose a mentor you'd like to be followed by. Uh, there will be uh, open, open calls will be open till end of August, 31st of August. There will then be a selection of four nominees per mentor. And this will lead to a workshop of four people with a mentor one-on-one -on -one, uh, where you'll be able to discuss work, have feedback on your mix, and hopefully become a better DJ and a better artist. Um, so stay tuned. Thanks again to uh, the Vlaams Gemeenschap Commissie, Commissie uh, the VGC. We are Kiosk Radio. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.